Welcome back. The Army's reviewing results now from its data summit last month. The Army says its data community is, quote, at the frontier of a new battle space. Lionel Garcia is the chief information officer of the Army. His office co-hosted the summit with AFSIA's Kansas City chapter. Leo, welcome back to the program. It's good to have you on again. What did you hope to learn from the data summit, and what have you learned about data so far from it? Well, Francis, thanks for inviting me. I'm, I'm excited to be here again to, to have a, a good chat with you about the data summit. So second data summit we've had in the Army is our second annual one. Um, great turnout. We had about a 980% increase in the number of folks that attended. Uh, and our goal really this year was to assess where are we in the story, right? So as we continue to mature across the Army in our kind of data transformation, um, this really was the first opportunity where we've had some reps and some sets on, on some big data initiatives. Uh, and we've really gotten functional folks across the entire Army to really get knee deep into their data sets uh, and where they can maximize uh, leveraging that data. So this year was really important to us. Focus a lot on C2 and what that looks like moving forward as we look at major Army efforts like Next Generation C2 is how can we really lay that foundation for data uh, and really start to assess across um, our functional areas, what that health and maturity is. We've seen a lot of great work on the on the business side. So when we talk about our business systems and what we're doing in that space, very mature data space, lots of folks working it. They've been working it for years, uh, slowly trying to creep that in throughout the rest of the Army and across. So I think this has been the, the, the first time that we've been able to get the community at large, uh, which included kind of positions that didn't exist, you know, three, four years ago. We have a lot a lot of folks now in commands with chief data officers that are sitting there uh, and they're really kind of wrangling inside all the commands and the functional areas their space so so we're really excited that this has been our first opportunity to get the community after some maturing together mm -hmm. to really look at what the next steps are going to be what is driving a 980 percent increase in people that care about data to the point where they want to spend a day of their lives discussing it with their peers oh that's such a great question so a lot of things are driving that so so, so the first thing that's really pushing that hard right now is kind of a, a commitment that we've made to really push out more low-code, no-code platforms and really democratize the ability for folks to answer their own questions. Uh, you know, the Army Data Platform, Vantage, has been very critical to that effort as we laid that platform out three years ago and really kind of democratized it out to the force. We've really seen folks take to it and move really fast to kind of take charge of their data to answer their own questions. And what that's done is, right, it's, it's kind of given the ability for soldiers and civilians in our workforce to really move out. In fact, I'd say it's really interesting when you look at the metrics, almost holistically across the board and across every command, it's kind of like 80% of the folks using the platform are government uh, and military folks. We have very few of our contract workforce actually sitting on there building stuff. It's mostly organic mm -hmm. at this point. So we've made a commitment to make more of those platforms available. The other piece that's really helped is, you know, we, we locally call it the automation or die memo, uh, but really is this big push uh, by the secretary to, to automate as much as possible. So we're on the very beginning of our journey right now. We're still in the collection phase of it, of really going throughout the Army and asking, hey, where do we have some opportunities to take these human intensive processes and either automate them uh, or, or add some uh, AI ML to? And really that, that delivery of those low-code, no-code platforms has really accelerated that. You've been pretty strident in your view that you should go for commercial platforms as much as you can, especially for artificial intelligence. How does that intersect with the work that you did at the Data Summit and the work overall that you're doing around data in the Army? Oh, great question. So the, the Data Summit really informed where people were, right, where our workforce was when it came to AI. Still very much, like we talk about, we're maturing in data. I think we're in a good place in that maturation process. I think when we look at AIML, we ju in no November of last year, we made a commitment to get capability out uh, about four months Months ago, we introduced the Army Enterprise Large Language Model Workspace, and our intent was to make as many of the commercial models ubiquitously available and democratize out to the force and build really large guardrails uh, and let folks run. So we've seen really uh, a massive growth. We went, I, I think it was in less than 72 hours, we went from zero folks on the platform to over 5,000 folks on the platform, and we're at like 19,000 right now. So we've seen that steady growth across the board. 
lots of learning still, lots of training, but the data summit really was the first opportunity we had to talk, hey, where are these opportunities, right? Because some of it is local no-code platforms help us automate, then the other piece was like, where can we use large language models uh, and which are the right ones for the tasks that we're looking? So I, I think the, the data summit really was a catalyst to get things moving for us in that direction. Do you have a sense among the artificial intelligence use cases that people are exploring using the tools that you just talked about, how much of them are what people might categorize as tip of the spear and how much of them are back office functions and so on to try to help you get uh, a better handle on business processes and that type right. of thing. So we're seeing a healthy mix, but really what we've seen a lot more of is a lot of back office words. Uh, areas where folks can gain capacity, mm -hmm. right, uh, to do their mission. And be and within that space, we have two kind of camps. We have kind of the novice camp where we're seeing people still learning and uh, they're using glorified search, for lack of a better term, right? It's like search plus with some agentic AI built in. Uh, and then the other side is, is a way more mature camp where we have folks that are actively uh, using these models to write code, to quickly spin up pilot projects to answer very difficult army questions and then they can either integrate into a local no code platform or integrate into one of our programs of record so we're seeing kind of that space right there still very much back office focused. Mm -hmm. Do you have the resources and a strategy to move folks from those rookie users to the more veteran users over time? Oh yeah, most definitely. So that's that's really what we're working on right now. I think this next step, uh, the first step was, can we do enough data collection to understand what that path is even gonna look like? I think we feel very comfortable right now that we're starting to get a good landscape. So over the next year and probably into fiscal year 26, a lot more investment on the training side, uh, we're seeing less institutional type training, more ad hoc kind of commercially available training mm -hmm. uh, to get folks moving. I think the bigger thing is gonna be as we plot out how we move from this kind of democratize, self-service, get to a certain point, that next space is how do you make that big jump to the more mature kind of platforms that all are right. out there. I wanna explore that when we come back. So stand, uh, stand by for a moment. You can read more about all those topics on today's show page at fedgovtoday.com. More with Lionel Garcia when FedGov Today with Francis Rose continues in a moment. Welcome back. The Defense Information Systems Agency is preparing for the next generation of the Joint Warfighting Cloud Capability Contract. The Army instructed cloud consumers across the service recently to move all cloud buying to the contract. The Army CIO, Lionel Garcia, is back. Leo, why do you think it was necessary, why did you think it was necessary to explicitly tell folks the way that you did that if they're going to buy cloud, if they're going to use cloud, they need to do it through JWCC? Yeah, that's a, it's a good question. So about uh, 18 months ago, we, we made a, a very important decision in the Army. Uh, we had been going through a reseller. We had our own kind of contract. Um, not necessarily seeing the better buying power we, we expected on that, uh, and some challenges as to ownership of accounts and, and things that we felt uncomfortable. So we, we made a fundamental decision to move to JWCC. Uh, we were working in split operations for a while, so we still had legacy contract plus JWCC. Uh, we've cleaned that up over the last 18 months, uh, and as of, I think, three months ago now, uh, we now are fully on JWCC. We are their largest customer by far. We, we are about 62% of all workloads there, so number one shareholder. Um, so we we really wanted to get kind of things back in a box inside the Army, right? I think part of the challenge was we've been, we've been working split ops for a while. We're confusing the force. How do we codify that in a better way uh, across the force? Break, break. On top of that, the other piece that was really helpful was great great relationship with this uh, and, and the DOD CIO team and really letting us come in as a service and help them kind of massage the contract. I, as written originally, we very much focused on Fourth Estate. We had some challenges as one of you know, the biggest service out there coming in for all of our needs. Great partners and kind of remodifying and, and, and putting it in a good place. And now we're in a place where we can really leverage it. I think the big thing to think about is first opportunity to get at scale across the department, this idea of better purchasing power with the cloud providers. I think you can't beat all being there. Air Force is moving the same direction. Navy's kind of moving this direction. I think at the end of the day, really making sure that we get the best value uh, for the taxpayer as we uh, deploy cloud in, in the Army. What do you anticipate the next generation looking like, or how could it change to suit 
the needs of the best customers so far of JWCC. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So we we are heavily invested in our conversation with the with both the DISA team and the DoD CIO team on the next generation contract. We're hyper focused right now on making sure that we can have a, the same experience that you have in the commercial space, especially around marketplace where vendors have already come with products ready to go. Um, and then the other piece is this idea of how do you bring some of the SaaS providers in in a more efficient way so we don't have to do a lot of contract actions to do it. Our, our big thing is going to be can we maximize and streamline the approach to onboarding new customers and, and conversely onboarding uh, new industry partners into the environment. And that's really where the focus is going to be moving forward. One of the things uh, that the cloud has enabled in addition to what we talked about about data and AI and so on is the use of just a million different kinds of software applications. And one of the things that the department has struggled with for a long time is authorities to operate. You're a, you've gotten now to a continuous authority to operate environment. How did you get there? And what are the benefits that you expect to see as a result of that? Slowly is how we got there. <laughs> <laughs> right, so um, yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. Uh, you know, it's been, uh, 24 months of a lot of labor with a lot of great folks to, to kind of get to where we are. Really focus on, on four critical areas. One was this idea of validating capabilities that are out there uh, for software and saying, hey, look, this is what's in our inventory. This is what we're going to use. The next piece to that was really saying, if you've got, if you're using those capabilities and you put them together, here's what a uh, CICD pipeline looks like. And the last piece was, what's your con op, right? What's your concept of operation? How are you going to operate this, as, whether it be a command or a program? Uh, and really getting those three things in place, we got that done through policy and pushed that out. We've now farmed about 42 different efforts, right? And of those 42 different efforts, as of last week, three of them are officially in continuous ATO. Uh, and it's a, it's a smattering of capabilities, right? It's everything from stuff at a, at a major command to an actual PEO. So so still very much uh, maturing in our journey to CATO, but I am happy to say that from where we were a year ago, which was like just policy formulation and what does this look like and bringing the community along, we do have three programs now that have a CATO. Just signed the last one yesterday. Are you getting to a point where now you're going to see critical mass and you'll be able to replicate this process again and again since you've kind of, it sounds like you've figured out the formula? Yeah, I, I do believe so. I think where, where we have some maturity in our programs, we're going to see that happen very quickly. Uh, something interesting that kind of fell out of the entire effort was a lot of folks were like wondering to rule them all. We decided that probably wasn't the answer. Um, we said, hey, there's going to be some, some variety here, uh, but we're finding that commands and programs are, are coming into that variety so if they see someone that looks and smells similar to what they need they're jumping on that so it's shortening their timeline to get to a CATO so as opposed to like kind of hey we'll build this all over again so I, I think we're getting that critical mass right now still gonna take a while mm -hmm. take some time contract changes people change there's a lot going on at the same time uh, but we're excited where we are is the process that you undertook replicable in another service of the military or in the fourth estate or in a civilian agency oh, yeah. or is it peculiar to the army because of whatever reason Reason. No, definitely. We, we were very much focused on uh, being kind of vanilla about it in order to give us some ability to have diversity on what we were approving. Um, so yeah, it can be used as a service. I think our bigger thing in our next step, which is a step I'm really excited about, is looking for industry partners who want to do this in a, a commercially operated, commercially owned environment. So that's kind of our next step. We have some about three industry partners right now that are working with us to figure out how we do this in a COCO model. And that would really give the Army kind of a full suite of tools, right? Whether it be COCO or GOGO or kind of GOCO, the ability to have those capabilities available for use. That, that speaks to a broader transition that we've kind of touched on in different parts of this conversation and that we talked about in the first part of right. this program today, and that is moving as much as you can where it's appropriate to commercial solutions. How do you make those determinations either on a macro level or on a micro level about where commercial works and where commercial doesn't work in the Yeah, and, and our strategy has been, and I've been very upfront about it, right? Commercial first, SaaS as much as possible, like we really embrace what's already uh, working uh, in the private sector and bring that in a smart way and rethink our processes, right? So there should be less customization, right? Logistics is logistics is logistics, right? We shouldn't be inventing our own way of doing that. So I think uh, our big conversation right now is focusing folks first uh, commercial and not commercial only because I mean, there, there's areas where, where we do need to do some stuff behind the fence line. Um, 
We've seen a good demand signal from our customers, though, and our customers are jumping on board. They're seeing the barrier to entry be very low when we go commercial. And I'm going to be honest, I think the big thing has been us as an army and, and, and me as CIO putting out the message that says, hey, these are the approved platforms, these are approved low-code, no-code things, and making that just available, mm -hmm. right, with no kind of person in the middle has really pushed kind of the army forward at looking at commercial being a first place to go. And that strikes me as not just a solution to the tactical aspect of it, but to the cultural aspect oh, yeah. of it too, to signal to people not only is it okay to do things this way, we encourage you now to do these things in a different way. Is yeah. that a fair read on Oh, that's a, that's a great read. I think that those folks that really want to move fast are finding that the more commercial they go, the more SaaS they go, the faster they get from, from zero to hero, right? We have about a minute left, and I want to go back to something that we talked about in the first part of this program. You said uh, in, the, uh, in the use of the artificial intelligence tools that we talked about that a vast majority of those folks were Army personnel and of much smaller percentage were contractors. What do you want to do to perpetuate that, to continue to drive your Army personnel people to experiment, to uh, try different tools, to take advantage of the cultural things that you're doing to change things, that kind of thing. Yeah, our, my big thing is make as many of the tools available as we can in a safe place for where folks can use them and maximize the training opportunities out there. I think a big thing is not everyone's an expert. We got to get some hands-on keyboard, right? It's like learning to drive a car. You got to get in it first and start trying to drive. So I think our big thing is let's make capabilities available. And then over time, we'll figure out where we have to tighten up guardrails, where we maybe have to make some enterprise level decisions, maybe shrink that pool down. Um, but the big piece for me is, can we get capability in folks' hands so they can move out? Leo, it's great to have you on the program. Thanks very much for joining uh, thank me Thank you, appreciate for being back. You can read more about all the topics that we covered on today's show page at fedgovtoday.com. FedGovToday continues in just a moment.